thank you for joining me today on the CMDA Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Chupp, the CEO of CMDA. And today my guest will be explaining how COVID-19 is impacting the mental health of both patients and you as healthcare professionals. You know, I was reading this week the most recent edition of JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and I read an article entitled, COVID's 19 Crushing Effects on Medical Practices, Some of Which Might Not Survive. The article pointed out that in a survey of 724 medical practices that COVID-19 was having a rather severe negative financial effect on 97% of them. And then in another survey, they pointed out that the Texas Medical Association found 68% of practicing physicians in that state had cut their work hours because of COVID-19, and 62% had had their salaries reduced. Well, last week I had a phone conversation with a former missionary friend who's a family physician, and he's been working full time in an urgent care walk-in in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He's cutting back to half time to launch a new ministry leadership position with us at CMDA. So I asked him, how tough is it going to be for you to cut back your patient care? And he told me that cutting back in the midst of this summer surge of COVID-19 in Milwaukee is going to be a wonderful, in his words, relief and respite. Well, it's in that backdrop that I wanted to talk with Christian psychiatrist Dr. Tom Okamoto. He's a board certified adult psychiatrist with a specialty in adolescent psychiatry, and he's the co chair of our very own CMDA psychiatry section. Previously, he held a post as assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at the UCLA School of Medicine, as well as medical director of the Minerth Meyer Clinic West, adult and adolescent inpatient programs. He's currently an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine in Santa Ana, California. He's married with three adult children. So I invite you now to listen in on my conversation with Dr. Okamoto, together with my co-host, Dr. Jeff Barrows, who's our CMDA Senior Vice President for Bioethics and Public Policy. Well, I want to welcome to the microphone today, Dr. Tom Okamoto to our program, CMDA Matters. Tom is a psychiatrist on the west or left coast, as some say, and is also the chair of our psychiatry section at CMDA. And I've invited also Dr. Jeff Barros, our senior vice president of bioethics and public policy. Uh, We're going to have three physicians talking about mental health issues in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. So welcome, Tom. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. It's a blessing. Uh, I'm co-chair with Brian Briscoe, who's out in the Kentucky area as well. So we try to cover both sides of the right and left uh, areas if, if we can. It's an interesting field to be in these days. Well, can you tell us a couple of things so our listeners can get to know you just a little bit better? Tell us about your your faith walk, and then tell us about your history with the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. I was raised in Southern California, had a grandmother who took care of me while uh, my parents were at work. Uh, She was full-on first-generation Japanese, but uh, my grandparents had been converted by the church uh, when they got here by the Methodists and were planning to become missionaries. So it was very interesting background. The uh, internment in World War II came and that kind of got put on hold. But in the meantime, I came along afterwards and uh, I was raised by her and grew up uh, hearing Rock of Ages and a lot of old hymns and in high school was part of the Jesus uh, movement and gave my life over to Christ at that time and kind of little by little kind of grew and grew and as time went on ended up in psychiatry and uh, definitely God's direction in hand bringing me to a very unusual place in medicine but got involved with groups here and there that were very influential uh, uh, Minners Meyer and 
McLeod and Townsend uh, approached me to do their medical directing and I became a psychiatrist for their units and uh, eventually as time went on grew uh, more and more into the role of private practitioner and seeing a lot of people in the church including people in the u- local Christian universities and theology schools and just grew uh, more and more and eventually became part of CMDA and have felt that it was very uh, much part of uh, God's direction as time has gone on through my career. So you joined Tom when you were a graduate or an hour uh, during medical school? I connected late into my career as a, an assistant clinical professor. I had been doing some things with the local psychiatric society in uh, governmental affairs and uh, learning about community uh, relationships and uh, felt like, well, there's something called the CMDA and there's a psychiatry section and I should be a part of that. So the past few years have jumped in and enjoyed the fellowship and uh, kind of a unique ministry within CMDA is now psychiatry has become a big part of medicine. So kind of late in my career, but uh, a good time. Within medicine, and certainly uh, psychiatrists who are Christians, I must say that as I was going through my own general surgery practice in a community hospital and and then serving overseas and having short-term doctors come and serve with us, I really didn't encounter that many Christians in psychiatry. Are there many out there, Tom? There are actually a lot of closet Christians who are psychiatrists. The, the field started out very early with... Uh, one of the early psychoanalysts, Oscar Feaster, who was uh, a very good friend of uh, Freud's, and he was trying to kind of win him over, and there were some uh, victories in terms of having Freud confronted and understand the faith. But since that time, and even before then, when psychiatry was first birthed in the 1800s, there were a lot of Christians, physicians, who were initially neurologists who saw the whole side of mental illness and were really touched that there's this whole part of humanity that had mental illnesses that were not characterized and not treated. And since then, a number of famous uh, psychiatrists who are also Christian, who we never knew they were Christian until you started to look into it. Uh, Winnicott, who has a lot to do with, he was a pediatrician, became an early psychoanalyst. Uh, Benjamin Rush, who's the father of American psychiatrists, uh, major figures in psychiatry who are Christian. Their their faith has been sort of written out of the history books, and you have to look for it. But uh, even in my own area in Southern California, when you start looking at license plates and and you start talking about faith and spirituality now, the past few years, there's a, an evidence base that spirituality and religion is very helpful in mental health. The field actually has included caucus on religion and psychiatry and spirituality. Uh, There's a lot of research base for uh, including spirituality in treatment planning and part of the interviews now are to include spiritual histories. So psychiatry has warmed up to spirituality and is no longer antagonistic. And uh, a lot of Christian psychiatrists are there. They just have been very uh, hidden, and now they're kind of coming out, so to speak, and being a little more comfortable with their role as uh, psychiatrists who also go to church, who also have a spiritual life, who also are growing in the faith with their careers. Well, Tom, that's that's very good to know, especially with this recent COVID-19 pandemic. So I wanted to ask you what kinds of mental health issues have people been experiencing and what have you what have you seen in your practice in dealing with COVID-19? At this stage I am more of an outpatient psychiatrist so I am not in the hospitals but I do have uh, colleagues who are deeply embedded in the hospital practice or CNL psychiatrists so they are seeing a lot of mental ravaging of the patients in terms of neuropsychiatric syndromes deliriums, dementia, disexecutive syndromes, along with the uh, worsenings of mood disorders, psychotic disorders. It's uh, 
worse than has been in the public. It's very difficult. And a lot of times the mental part of all of this, the neuropsychiatric, is relegated to the background a little bit because we're just trying to help these patients survive. So it's very significant uh, in terms of depression, anxiety, PTSD. What's interesting is that uh, now it's, it's such an international illness and, and science has tried to coordinate all of our research efforts. We're getting research papers coming from all over the globe in terms of mental health issues and effects of COVID on the population, on frontline providers, because we've been preparing for something like this in terms of uh, mental health effects of pandemics and uh, traumatic events like this in the culture for quite a while. So even just things like unemployment issues in, in the society have affected suicide rates and are uh, a significant concern. So this is not just projected concerns. These are databases that we pull from that uh, these events in culture and society and globe, global health affect mental uh, health very severely. So Tom, I've you know, been hearing about uh, the incidence of headaches among these COVID-19 patients, but I, this is the first time hearing about neuropsychiatric manifestations of the illness. Are, they, are those primary to COVID-19 or are those secondary just to being to ill patients? Uh, both. Some of the uh, early papers in, from Italy when it was at the heat of uh, infection were coming out with numbers as high as 30 to 40 percent with neuropsychiatric uh, syndromes and people in the ICUs very common to have deliriums and uh, confusional states, people who have just lost orientations. And then what is now a concern is post-intensive care syndromes that after you've been ventilated for even a few days, people are somewhat traumatized and still recovering in terms of acute confusional states or deliriums. It takes a while and sometimes they're discharged with these syndromes where they have deficits that sometimes recover and sometimes they're not recovering. So that's a very huge concern now that people are out of the hospital more and more. There is uh, kind of the, the reevaluation of, okay, how bad is the disability from the infections? Well, I'm sure our listeners would like to hear from you. What sort of mental health issues have first-line responders been experiencing on the front lines of care? I, I would guess that not too many of our listeners have not heard about Dr. Lorna Breen and um, mm -hmm. uh, taking of her life. And subsequent to that, you and I have been participating in a session called Oasis in New mm -hmm. York City, which is a gathering of Christian physicians and other healthcare professionals to encourage one another to worship God together. And, you know, we've heard some stories from that gathering, but what, uh, overall, what has been your experience in hearing from first-line responders? What's been going on? It's a matter of how familiar you are and how close you are to the folks that are providing the frontline care. Uh, there's kind of a, a sense of a little bit of shame and stigma attached to opening this whole field up. It's like anybody who goes through stress reactions or acute trauma you sort of compartmentalize it, you don't want to talk about it, but uh, more and more in, in places where there is a lessening of the acuity of the numbers, people are kind of reevaluating what they've been through. A lot of difficulty with you know the typical things you hear, which is depression, anxiety, stress reactions, but you know our, our population of providing health care has also been very vulnerable to concepts like burnout and the change in medicine these days leading to an increase in suicide rates. So it's a actually a very vulnerable population when things happen and uh, there aren't enough resources. There's a lot of external fears and fears of uh, what do we do? How do we keep our families safe? How do we deal with the financial and just the issues at home in terms of kids are at home, not going to school? just pragmatic day-to-day -day kinds of issues and then issues of what's uh, been starting to, to write about in terms of healthcare provision is moral injuries. When the uh, infections were at its peak, there was a lot of, let's say, in quotes, clinical choices of who gets the ventilator, when does the ventilator go, who gets the healthcare, and who decides who doesn't get the healthcare. And those are 
choices that you would think would be happening on the missions field or in a third world country. But we we're kind of surprised and horrified that maybe the medical system in the United States still was vulnerable to those kinds mm -hmm. of problems and lack of resources and the physicians have we've not been kind of trained how to deal with that kind of stress it's it's very kind of a surprising thing there are attempts and good things that have been done and uh, more research is going to be coming out in the next few months about this about how to better prepare and how to better manage teams of providers and how to help people get through this uh, more proactively because it was just so quick and harsh that people were just trying to survive it and not enough PPEs and so forth. It was just such a shock how bad it was. Well, that brings up a question I wanted to ask you, Tom, and, and we're seeing, at least in some parts of the country, a, a diminution in the rate of infection, and hopefully that will not only uh, continue but increase through the summer, but uh, we may have, a, and people are expecting a, an increase in the pandemic in the fall. So what advice would you give to first responders and healthcare professionals to prepare themselves for that possible coming increase in the next few months? Ooh, that's uh, a scary thought, and we're just kind of taking a breath in uh, certain areas. I think in down where I'm at in Southern California, we're kind of tentatively very worried that uh, numbers are going up and we, we are well supplied and we have more data about how to care for people who are infected, but uh, we're very tense about what we're going to see in the next few months. Uh, it's not going away anytime really soon, but there is an interesting article that I, would, I came across from the UK in some place where you're kind of surprised it came from. It was a European heart journal from acute cardiovascular care. This was early in April, and it was by Walton, Murray, and Christian, a mental health care for medical staff and affiliated healthcare workers during the COVID pandemic. Really good information and really good suggestions about how to manage the stress, kind of a review article of mental health effects and how to manage them practically. So talking about things like uh, how you take care of your team if you're in a leadership position, how are you to take care of your colleagues who you see, you know, to kind of step up and watch and make sure the mental health issues of everybody around you are being addressed and attended to, how you can be a better colleague or a better leader, and how you can, as an administrator, help with uh, being proactive with providing supports for the families, for the care providers, like rooms for rest, for food, for structure, and to uh, help reduce the anxiety. So there are a number of uh, international studies that have been very helpful. Early studies from China actually were, be, were helpful in describing what types of interventions they they would provide teams of mental health providers that were embedded into the hospitals and the intensive care units would just roam and be present. And they've adopted this in some of the hospital systems in New York as well, where take care of their chaplains, taking care of uh, family issues or just available for decompressing and being aware of any moment that a healthcare provider may need to vent of a, a trauma situation and uh, help with things like taking kids somewhere or arranging food or supplies or uh, just practical kinds of things and hospitals providing rest areas where people can take naps or get food or uh, just practical things that uh, when it's really hot and heavy it's sort of very helpful just to have basic things like that going on. Tom, I wanted to ask, you know, as I've read multiple different articles about the stresses that healthcare professionals have faced in this pandemic, and that the word uncertainty is really the word that sort of describes what whether there's whether it's you're a dentist sitting on the sideline because your practice is closed or 
uh, you're a specialist who's not able to do most of your surgery because it's elective, or you're in the ICU hospitalist taking care of COVID-19 patients. It's just uncertainty. And then all of the mental stress involved with that uh, emotional stress that out of this, maybe a silver lining would be a huge push, a huge jump start to physician wellness programs across this country like never before because mm-hmm. of COVID-19. Would you anticipate that happening, that, that the stigma maybe is going to be washed away a little bit more than before and that uh, healthcare professionals will be more willing to look for help because this is something we've never faced before? I think it's the the efforts have been positive to try to get there. But we're built uh, with certain DNA training with the way we do and uh, needing the ag- aggressiveness and denial to be in the front lines and to take care of patients and to jump in when uh, we may have personal fear or anxiety about certain things. Uh, our goal is to treat patients and we're kind of grown to do that. So it's always going to be difficult to acknowledge weakness and uh, needs and self-care. Those are things that are very kind of on the bottom of the list because we do what we do. But what they found is that if you provide, let's say, as an administrator, a hospital director, if you proactively have these things in place already, the discomfort uh, becomes much less and the utilization can be increased. It's all anywhere in the world. Doctors are resistant to Uh, acknowledging their own weaknesses and the needs for their own support and care. When people are there in the moment, ready to catch and listen, these can be chaplains, they can be mental health people, they can be leaders on the team to be trained to be watching for these moments where somebody needs to decompress and somebody needs to have some place to process through their stress at home or some tragedy that they've been part of or you know, multiple patients dying how you know you need to be able to pray or process through that and to have somebody there that's when the you know when the need is there and somebody is available that's when good things can happen and, and that's what uh, leaders can provide in those moments and so you know it's not a comfortable thing it's a little more acceptable but there will still be part of us that's built in to try to be strong and to de- you know to put our own needs aside and uh, there are ways that we can catch those moments where there's a need and uh, we can actually do good work at that point Tom I, I wanted to ask it's it's been reported by some who've studied physicians and their mental health issues that uh, doctors are much more willing to open up to a colleague in their network than they are with a mental health professional. Like that, that's the ultimate admission that I'm broken, I failed. So, so many of our listeners, the majority are not mental health professionals. So what recommendations would you make to those of us who've not studied psychiatry and who don't do this for a living? What kind of recommendations would you make to us when we hear about stress, difficulties, uh, and some level of brokenness coming from our colleagues? The stigma and shame that we carry as physicians, kind of expected to be super heroes these days, and this is part of this whole thing about heroes and cowards these days, there's so much stigma to not fulfill that role of the super person without weakness. Uh, As Christians, we know that that's quite not a healthy thing and it's spiritually not the right direction for us but we all are encouraged to be there as uh, mds these days and first liners are pressured so stigma is huge so we have to consider especially the ones who are believers that we take the mantle for supporting and caring for and loving our colleagues as leaders we can you know, be better leaders in terms of looking out for mental health issues and wellness issues. Mm-hmm. Look for how our colleagues and our, our team members are doing in terms of uh, sleep and anxiety management and uh, stress tolerance and coping, uh, how 
family time is available or not available. How are people doing self-care? We have to each look at our colleagues and see what they need and how are they doing and ask and talk and communicate, be supportive, spend time and make sure you know that other people are getting enough sleep and are taking care of themselves and uh, families are being cared for. Just you know, what can you do to support them on your shifts off and so forth? So we have to take that time since uh, the hurdle of going to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist outside of your sphere is really looked upon as a last resort. So, and, and in terms of the studies, for the most part, people will adapt and adjust if they have some humanity and uh, support around them. People experience a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress, but for most people, they recover. Some people need some treatment. Some people need more attentiveness and care and management or monitoring by the leadership. But most of the folks on the front lines actually are pretty resilient. And are there markers that you can give us that would say, hey, Mike, you, you run into a colleague who says this or is doing this or you notice this. This is someone you need to be strongly urging to get help from a mental health professional. Talking about the kinds of things that you see in the list, but change in personality, irritability, uh, lack of patience, impulsiveness, lack of energy, people who appear drained and are not taking care of themselves, who are not kind of keeping a balance. Uh, one of the conferences I attended talked about portion control. If people are not doing portion control of food, sleep, relationships, the internet, and so forth, uh, those are kind of signs that maybe people are out of balance or not able to manage the stress. So, uh, But things like panic attacks, sleep, cognitive function, and emotional reserves are things that you watch for. And uh, if somebody's having a lot of trouble and being a little more impulsive and having decisions that are not their typical decision process, sometimes it's helpful to suggest and uh, kind of give a list of, okay, there are a lot of apps, there are a lot of uh, ways that the hospitals sometimes have transition to certain treatment areas. So it's a very tricky thing, but uh, if we all do it, then it's not so much unusual. Well, we've basically run out of time, uh, Dr. Okamoto. I want to thank you and uh, Dr. Brian Briscoe and uh, Marshall Williams, who's your administrative mm -hmm. assistant in the psychiatry mm -hmm. section. I think you guys are an incredible group of leaders who are very interested. I was one of the, my disappointments, one of many of my disappointments in the cancellation of the national convention was the afternoon session that you had planned to talk to us, give us an update on management of depression. But I, I want to encourage you. I know one of your motivations is that uh, you get out among our many chapters in the various schools and encourage students to consider psychiatry as a profession. It does seem like a profession that is somewhat broken and has become uh, secularized. And I think Dr. Barrows here will, will agree yeah. with me that we're struggling against a lot of brokenness. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom, for taking the time to be with us today. It's been a pleasure to be here and uh, keep praying for the CMDA and its great ministries. Dr. Okamoto mentioned that psychiatry is becoming an increasingly secular specialization, and that may be a turnoff to believers who are seeking professional counseling. Yet Christians struggling with depression are often facing stigma within the church and feelings of their own personal spiritual failure. We have a brand new book at CMDA called Downcast. It was published earlier this year, and it promotes the biblical and medical hope for depression. It was written by Dr. Jennifer Harris, who was my guest on CMDA Matters a couple of months ago, also with Dr. Harold Koenig and Dr. John Petit. It's a very thoughtful and practical guide, and it weaves together scripture, theology, cutting edge scientific research, and the stories of many well-known and highly respected Christians who have suffered themselves with depression. 
The author's desire is to help those with depression, whether they're followers of Christ or those yet to experience God's grace and forgiveness for them to find healing. This book can be purchased on our website at cmda.org store, or just call us at 888-230-2637 and we'll get it to you right away. If you are a colleague in your clinic or practice or hospital is struggling to deal with the additional stress which COVID-19 has added to their lives, you can check out CMDA's Center for Wellbeing at cmda.org slash wellbeing. This is a growing ministry of CMDA created to empower and assist healthcare professionals to align with God, optimize well-being, and maximize your influence in healthcare. Back in July, I interviewed Dr. David Goodman on CMDA Matters regarding a Bible study that he developed on the book of James, available on the CMDA Student Life app. He told us about a new Bible study he was writing entitled, Teach Us to Pray. And it's based on the Lord's Prayer. It is now available and can be found on the CMDA Student Life app which is a free download on iTunes or Google Play or your usual source of apps for your phone or device. As I wrap up this podcast, I want to remind you a new CMDA Matters podcast is released every Thursday and encourage you to subscribe in iTunes or Google Play or what other podcast subscription platform you use. You can choose to listen to CMDA Matters on your smartphone, your computer, your tablet, or wherever you are and whenever you want. You can also listen to it on our CMDA app or at cmda.org slash CMDA matters. You know, the truth about the causes and appropriate ways to handle depression and anxiety often become distorted in our world today. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus reminds us, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus tells us that God's desire for us is to live abundantly, friends, experiencing joy in Him and all the good gifts He has given to us, those of us, His sons and daughters, who serve Him in health care. This is Dr. Mike Chupp signing off for now and reminding you that what matters to you matters to CMDA and CMDA Matters. We'll see you next week, God willing. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.